possibility scenario. There's an article written 30-some years ago now. It was in Moody Monthly magazine. It was called That Hideous Doctrine. The author is John Thomas. He says this, A close look at hell can make us more godly and compassionate. That hideous doctrine of hell is fading. How often have you thought of it in the past month, for instance? Does it make a difference in your concerns for others, in your witness? Is it a constant and proper burden? He's talking to Christians. Most believers would have to say no. But the individual isn't the only one to blame. After all, the doctrine no longer gets its float in the church parade. It has become a museum piece at best, stored in the shadows of a far corner. The reality of hell, however, demands we haul the monstrous thing out again and study it until it changes us. Ugly, garish, and familiar as it is, this doctrine will indeed have a daily, practical, and personal effect on every believer who comes to terms with its force. Our Lord's words on the subject are unnerving. In Luke 16, he tells us of a rich man who died and went to Hades, which is the present hell, the abode of the unsaved dead between death and final judgment. From that story and a few other revelatory facts, we can infer several characteristics of hell. First, it's a place of great physical pain. The rich man's initial remark concludes with his most pressing concern, quote, I am in agony in the flame. He's using a different translation, but you get the point. We do not make enough of this. We all have experienced pain to some degree. We know it can make a mockery of all of life's goals and beauties. Yet we do not seem to know pain as a hint of hell a searing foretaste of what will befall those who do not know Christ, a grim reminder of what we will be spared from. God does not leave us with simply the mute fact of hell's physical pain. He tells us how real people will respond to that pain. Our Lord is not being macabre. He is simply telling us the truth. First, there will be weeping Luke 13, 28. Weeping is not something we get a grip on. It is something that grips us. Recall how you were affected when you last heard someone weep. Remember how you were moved with compassion to want to protect and restore that person. The Lord wants us to know and consider what an upsetting experience it is for a person in hell. Another response will be wailing. Matthew 13, 42. While weeping attracts our sympathy, wailing frightens and offends us. It is the pitiable ball of a soul seeking escape. Hurt beyond repair, eternally damaged. A wail is sound gone grotesque because of conclusions we can't live with. A third response will be gnashing of teeth, Luke 13, 28. Why? Perhaps because of anger or frustration. It may be a defense against crying out or an intense pause when one is too weary to cry any longer. Hell has two other aspects, rarely considered, which are both curious and frightening. On earth, we take for granted two physical properties that help keep us physically, mentally, and emotionally stable. The first is light. The second is solid, fixed surfaces. Oddly, these two dependables will not accommodate those in hell. Hell is a place of darkness, Matthew 8, 12. Imagine the person who has just entered hell, a neighbor, relative, co-worker, friend, 
after a roar of physical pain, blasts them. He spends his first moments wailing and gnashing his teeth. But after a season, he grows accustomed to the pain. Not that it's become tolerable, but that his capacity for it has enlarged to comprehend it. Yet not be consumed by it. Though he hurts, he is now able to think, and he instinctively looks about him. But as he looks, he sees only blackness. In his past life, he learned that if he looked long enough, a glow of light somewhere would yield definition to his surroundings. So he blinks and strains to focus his eyes, but his efforts yield only blackness. He turns and strains his eyes in another direction. He waits. He sees nothing but unyielding black ink. It clings to him, smothering and oppressing him. Realizing that the darkness is not going to give way, he nervously begins to feel for something solid to get his bearings. He reaches for walls or rocks or trees or chairs. He stretches his legs to feel the ground and touches nothing. Hell is a bottomless pit, Revelation 20, 1 and 2. However, the new occupant is slow to learn. In growing panic, he kicks his feet and waves his arms. He stretches and lunges, but he finds nothing. After more feverish tries, he pauses from exhaustion, suspended in black. Suddenly, with a scream, he kicks, twists, and lunges until he is again too exhausted to move. He hangs there, alone in his pain. Unable to touch a solid object or see a solitary thing, he begins to weep. He sobs, or his sobs choke through the darkness. They become weak, then lost in hell's roar. As time passes, he begins to do what the rich man did. He again starts to think. His first thoughts, his first thoughts are of hope. You see, he still thinks as he did on earth, where he kept himself alive with hope. When things got bad, he always found a way out. If he felt pain, he could take medicine. If he were hungry, he ate food. If he lost love, there was more love to be found. So he casts about in his mind for a plan to apply to the hope building in his chest. Of course, he thinks, Jesus, the God of love, can get me out of this. He cries out with a surge, Jesus, Jesus, you were right. Help me, get me out of this. He waits breathing hard with desperation. The sound of his voice slips into the darkness and is lost. He tries again. I believe, Jesus. I believe now. Save me from this. Again, the darkness smothers his words. Our sinner is not unique. Everyone in hell believes. He wearies of appeals. He does next what anyone would do, assessing a situation and attempts to adapt. But then it hits him. This is forever. Jesus made it very clear. He used the same words forever to describe both heaven and hell. Forever, he thinks. And his mind labors through the blackness until he aches. Forever, he whispers in wonder. The idea deepens, widens, and towers over him. The awful truth spreads before him like endless overlapping slats. 
When I put in 10,000 centuries of time here, I will not have accomplished one thing. I will not have one second less to spend here. As the rich man pleaded for a drop of water, so too our new occupant entertains a similar ambition. In life he learned that even bad things could be tolerated if one could just find temporary relief. Perhaps even hell, if one could rest from time to time, would be tolerable. He learns, though, that the smoke of his torment goes up forever and ever, and he has no rest day nor night. No rest day nor night. Think of it. Thoughts of this happening to people we know People like us are too terrifying to entertain for long. The idea of allowing someone to endure such torture for eternity violates the sensibilities of even the most severe judge among us. We simply cannot bear it. But our thoughts of hell will never be as unmanageable as its reality. We must take this doctrine of hell, therefore, and make sure we are practically affected by it. Good works will not save you. You've got to be perfect to go to heaven. Let me explain it to you this way. This hand representing you and me, and let this wallet represent our sin, okay? Here we are. We all have sin on us. We're all sinners, every one of us, including me. The Bible says this, though, God loves us. He does not hate us. He loves us. He hates our sin. See, sin separates us from God. You cannot get to heaven with even one sin. Now, every one of us is sin. Therefore, the way we are, we cannot go to heaven. So this throws out the idea that, well, I'm going to do good works and I'll earn my way to heaven. I'll be faithful. I'll go to church every week. I'll be baptized. I'll give money. I'll try to keep the commandments. I'll try to be a good person. I'll whatever. Walk old ladies across the street, whether they want to go or not. You know, I'm going to do something to try to earn my way to heaven. But the Bible says it's not of works. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, friends, our sin has to be paid for, and if we do it, we'll spend forever separated from God in hell. But here's the beauty of the message of the Bible. God so loves you and me. God loves us that he he knew our condition, and in eternity past before anything was ever created. We've been covering this in school with our students at NCS. God had the plan of salvation already set up. God himself, Jesus Christ, God the Son, would come into the world. It's what Christmas is all about. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This hand representing Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, you notice he is sinless. He came for the express purpose of paying for your sin, for my sin, so that we don't have to spend one second in hell. Jesus came and he took our sin upon himself. He died as our substitute. He made the payment so we don't have to. He shed his blood, was buried. He came back from the dead three days later. And he says in his word this, that if you will put your faith, your trust in him, that he made that payment for you, you're believing in him. You're trusting in him that that payment he made is for you. The moment you do, he says, you will not perish, but you have everlasting life. You're going to heaven no matter what whenever you die. Isn't that good news? See, and that's a free gift. The Bible says salvation is a free gift. Isn't it amazing we celebrate Christmas and we give all these gifts and then somebody hears, well, going to heaven's a free gift. You trust Christ. He's the one who bought and paid for it. I can't accept that. That's too easy. Wait a minute. You accept the Christmas gift? Well, yeah. Why won't you accept the greatest gift? Eternal life. God is the greatest giver of all. He gave us a son. When you trust Jesus Christ that he's paid for all your sins, he gives you everlasting life. When you trust him that he's done that, that payment is good on your behalf. That moment your sins are taken away, they are forgiven and he gives you everlasting life. He'll never lose you, he'll never cast you out. 
Now, that's great news. And by the way, good news. That's what the word gospel means. Good news. So, 